All right, guys. So this is going to be the second lesson uh, for this week here. Um, just a reminder, uh, yesterday's homework is going to be due uh, tonight by 11.59. So if you haven't finished that, make sure it does get complete. OK, uh, today we're going to move on to inverse relations and functions. All right. So there's quite a bit of information here. Um, again, if you at any point you need to pause the video, please pause it. You can rewind and do whatever you need to do. But again, you do need to practice these problems out on your own. So again, if you need to pause the videos at any point, please pause it and try those out. All right. So let's take a look here. Some essential understandings, some key words you'll need to know. If a relationship pairs element A of its domain to element B of its range, the inverse relation pairs B with A. So if you have the coordinate point of A, B of a relation, then B, A is the ordered pair of its inverse. If both A relation and its inverse uh, happen to be functions, then they are inverse functions. So we're going to look quite a bit at inverse today. So some continued information here. The inverse of a function may or may not be a function. So it kind of depends on what happens with the set there. So this diagram shows a relation R, which is a function, and its inverse, not a function. So again, the range of a relation is the domain of the inverse. The domain of the relation is the range of the inverse. So here are two different examples here of what a function is and what a function isn't. So to determine if it is a function or if it is not a function, every x value needs to have one y value. So as we can tell here, this is our domain. Domain is our x, range is our y. So in the first relation, their relation r, you can tell that every x value has one y value. Now again, it doesn't matter if it's the same y value. Again, all we care about is that every x value only has one y value. Now if we look at the inverse there on the inverse of r, we see that there, there's only two x values. One and two. So when we see that X has two Y values and two has two Y values, then that tells me that that cannot be a function there. So that's how we're going to determine if it's a function or not. Every X value should only have one Y value. That's how it's going to work. So we'll move on here. Finding the inverse of a relationship. So what's the inverse of relation S? It's very simple here. So anytime we are trying to solve for these here, guys, all you're going to do is just make a table and flip what X and Y are. So when we're looking for the inverse, the inverse here of S, then all we're going to do is make a table where all I do is just switch those X and Y values, which means that my uh, X should be negative 1, 0, 2, and three and my y value should be two or zero two three and four all right so again the inverse to find any inverse if they give you a table just switch your x and y value it should be pretty simple from there guys okay uh let's go ahead and move on here Example one continued. What are the graphs of S and its inverse? Now, if they give you a graph here, your first step is to write out what your points are. So in this one here, there are four points. So I'm going to go ahead and write those four points here. It doesn't matter the order of those points. All we're doing is just writing what those points are. So again, remember, you have to go inside the elevator before you go up or down. So again, we start at zero there. So that means if I start on that bottom point there, that's, that point should be zero, one. So zero, one. And then we have two zero. And then we have, what's that? Three two. And the last one looks like it's at four three. So this is just like the table that we had before. Here's our X's, there's our Y's. So to find any inverse that we're looking for here, guys, you always just switch your X and Y's. So to graph your inverses here, you're going to flip your points here. So that means the new, the inverse of these points here are going to be 1, 0, 0. I don't know what happened there. Let me erase that. So 1, 0. And then we have 0, 2. We'll have 2, 3. And then the last one will be 3, 4. So the cool thing about your inverses here is, so when you go look at the next graph here, 
all we did here is just po uh, plot those points there. So again, this is just the same thing. Those are the same points that we had. These blue points that we see right here are just the inverse of those points there. So the red dotted line is always going to be the inverse line. that It's kind of mirroring across that line there. That line, that inverse line, will always be called y of x, y equals x, sorry. Because if I look at the slope of that line, it's a slope of 1, and it goes through 0, so that's why it's y equal x. So again, if we kind of look there, those points are the same distance away from that line there. So whenever we look for an inverse, those inverses are always going to be reflected across the line of y equals x. Okay, so when we look for its final points there, in that final graph right there, those points are the same points that we wrote down at the very beginning. So just know to find the inverse of any points on the graph, start by writing the points down, rewrite them when we switch our x and our y, and know that it reflects across the line of y equals x. Those are kind of the things you just need to know there. Okay, example two, finding an equation with the oh, for the inverse sorry so what is the inverse of the relation described by y equals x squared minus one so your first step whenever it's asking you to find the inverse of an equation is to switch the places of x and y so i'm going to rewrite my equation i'm not going to change anything the only thing i'm changing is y and x everything else is going to stay the same so instead of writing y equals x squared minus one i'm going to write this now as x equals y squared minus one and we have to solve for y again always get y by itself this will give us the inverse first step get y by itself so i'm going to add one here to both sides so it should be y squared equals x plus one okay now my next step here to get rid of our square i'm going to take the square root of both sides Again, anytime we take the square root of both sides there, guys, we always have to put plus or minus in front of it. So if I take this, uh, well, on the right side there, the square root of y squared is just going to give me y. And that should equal plus or minus the square root of x plus 1. Okay, again, anytime you take the square root of something, it should give you plus or minus. All right, so uh, we'll move on here. Uh, graphing a relation in its inverse. So these are very simple here. So these are the same equations that we just solved for. Y equals X squared minus one and its inverse Y equals plus or minus the square root of X plus one. So what you're going to do is just type this into your calculator. It's very simple. You just type it into your calculator, y, uh, go to your y equals, type both these in, and uh, you don't have to put the plus or minus in for when you're graphing it. It's just for labeling purposes of it, okay? And you're going to check out uh, where their vertex, where they meet up at, okay? So they should meet up at the same vertex at both of these here. But just know that whenever you graph here, here's your graph right here, right? So here's the two things you're checking for whenever you look in your graph. Okay, so you're asking yourself, what type of graph am I looking at here? Anytime we're looking at an x squared or a square root, those are both just going to be parabolas. Okay, uh, the vertex uh, for the x squared is going to be at zero one. Oh, sorry, zero negative one. The vertex for the square root is going to be negative one zero. That's just how again we switch our x and our y. And again, just know where they reflect across. What's the line that they reflect across? It's going to be the same line every single time. Y equals X. So those are the things you need to know. Name the vertexes. So again, for both parabolas, what's the uh, lowest point that they get to? And the line they reflect across, which is Y equals X. Okay, so those are the things you're looking for on graphs. Okay. Example four, finding an inverse function here. So consider the function f of x equals the square root of x minus 2. It's going to ask you what is the domain and the uh, domain and range here. So when looking for domain and range, understand since we're looking at a square root here that the radicand or the numbers on the inside cannot be negative for a square root. 
if that's the case, then I have to set the uh, inside equal to zero and solve for uh, solve for x. All right, so that means on the inside there, we're gonna set x minus two. So x minus two equal to zero and solve for x. So this one's pretty simple. X should equal two. Okay, knowing that x equals two here. Okay, so this is gonna help us with our domain. So again, we cannot have negative numbers here. So again, if I plugged in a number like three, that would give me one. So I'm looking for numbers that are gonna be bigger than that x equals two right there. So for domain, for domain, it's gonna be x is greater than or equal than or equal to two. Okay. Again, it has to be, it cannot be negative. So that's why it has to be bigger than or equal to two in terms of range. Understand for range that that's our Y. So again, since we have a square root here, right? We have a square root. We're looking for real numbers here. So for our Y, it has to start with zero because again, if I put zero in there, the square root of zero is zero. So in terms of my range, we're going to say that y has to be greater than or equal to zero. Okay. Uh, what is the inverse of f? So again, same process here. So again, your first step, change f of x to y. So I'm going to change f of x to y. So it's y equals the square root of x minus 2. Next step, switch x and y. So it's going to be x equals the square root of y minus 2. Then from there, we're going to start solving for y. So again, since that minus 2 is on the inside of that square root, I have to take get rid of that square root by squaring it. So I'm going to parentheses, I'm going to square it. What I do to one side, I have to do the other. So now I'm left with x squared equals y minus 2. Two. And last step, get y by itself. So I'm going to add two here. So y should equal x squared plus two. So there is my inverse two. All right. There is our inverse. Okay. Let's go ahead and touch the next question there. What are the domain and range for our inverse here? So again, knowing that our inverse is a square, right? So knowing that it's a square, then that means for the domain alone, for the domain, we need our numbers here to be bigger than zero. We don't want negative numbers in there. So we're gonna say for our range here, or sorry, not for our, for our domain here, It's going to be, it's going to be that X has to be greater than or equal to zero. There's my domain. Now for the range, knowing that X has to be bigger than or equal to zero, uh, then we're going to use that here to help us out. So knowing that X has to be bigger than zero, if I were to plug that in for my Y, that would give me zero plus two, which gives me two. Right. So that means that Y has to at least be two. So since it's going to be bigger than zero here, that means that the numbers will continue getting bigger. If that's the case, we're going to say that Y has to be bigger than or equal to two. And the cool thing about looking for your inverses here for domain and range, if you find them for one, you're going to find them for the other. And what I mean by that is if we go back to that original one that we had where we said that our domain here was X is greater than or equal to two and Y is greater than or equal to zero. For our inverse, it's the same thing, but we just switch our X and our Y. So as you can tell here, it went from X is greater than or equal to two, Y is greater than or equal to. It went from Y is greater than or equal to zero to X is greater than or equal to zero. So if you find it for your, uh, your original, your starting function there, the inverse is just gonna be switching your X and your Y, very simple. Then, to determine if uh, your 
if your inverse function is a function, that means for every value of x, there is only one value of y. So if that's the case, again, uh, if, if I were to plug in, you know, numerous numbers, and again, the easiest way to kind of check for this here is to go through your calculator, right, and to check to make sure that every x value is only going to have one y value. You can also look at this through the vertical line test. If you to draw a vertical line, if you drew your uh, graph, right, and you did the vertical line test, that means if I uh, did a vertical line and it followed all the way through and there were only one, every, every x value only had one y value, then that means that that inverse function would be a function. If I followed along and then I looked at an x value where there were two y values, then that means that that is not a function. So the vertical line test could be the best way to kind of look for that. Okay. So in this example there, if I were to graph the equation of y equals x squared into my calculator, so I'll go to y equals, type in x squared plus 2, and graph it. As I can tell here when it comes up, right? If I were to do a vertical line test through that uh, graph there, I'd be able to tell that there is no x value that uh, has two y values because it's a parabola. And again, remember, parabolas continue to expand as they go on. So yes, the inverse would be a function. And again, you can't explain it how you, how you want to. You can just say vertical line test, however it may be, but just understand that yes, that is a function. Okay. So a few other things we only know. A central understanding. Functions that model real-world behavior are often exposed as formulas with meaningful variables. So again, if we're looking for the area of a circle, uh, there's your formula. Strictly speaking, the inverse formula would be r equals pi a squared. But this uh, expresses a false relationship between a and r. It is better to leave the variables in place and solve for r as a function of a. So again, it's just like anything else, right? It, it, if, if you're solving for certain variables, Get those variables by himself, and then if they have an exponent, then you take the square root of it. Or if they have a square root, you take the square root. It's always the opposite of it, right? Again, we've solved for variables before. It's nothing really different here. Okay? So here's a good example that I really like. So the function of, they give you a function of d equals 4.9 t squared, which represents the distance in meters that an object falls in t seconds due to Earth's gravity. Find the inverse of this function, how long in seconds, in seconds does it take for the cliff diver shown uh shown to reach the water below so again there's our diver it looks like it's 24 meters from him to get from the top to the bottom of there so if that's the case we start with our uh that we start with our distance there and we're trying to get that time by itself that means we need to get t by itself so my first step is to get that 4.9 away from t squared so i'm going to divide both sides by 4.9 that should leave me with t squared equals d over 4.9. To get rid of t squared, I take the square root of both sides. So that leaves me with t equals the square root of d over 4.9 and plug in the distance that he has remaining there, which is 24 meters. So it'd be 24 over 4.9 and take the square root of that. Again, you can use your calculator for that. It should come out to be right around 2.2 uh, seconds. Okay, so again, Make sure you know which variable you're solving for and then get that variable by itself. Very simple. Okay. One-to-one uh, -one function. You know that any function f, uh, it, each x value in the domain corresponds exactly to one y value in the range. For a one-to-one -one function, it is also true that each y value in the range corresponds to exactly one x value in the domain. A one-to-one -one function f has an inverse uh, that is also a function. If F maps A to B, then the inverse must map B to A, okay? So again, one-to-one -one just means that every X value has every one, uh, every, uh, one Y value, right? And vice versa. Every Y value is only have one X value, all right? So uh, also understand that composition can come into this as well. So we may not just solve for X. We may be solving for numbers as well. So again, your first step whenever we do uh, composition is always make sure, rewrite your equations. Anytime I see that circle, make sure you're rewriting your equations first. So let's take a look at that here. So for f of x equals 1 over x minus 1, uh, what is each of the following? So what is the inverse of x? So again, if we are looking for the inverse, that means our first step is to substitute y in for f of x and then switch your x and your y. So let's take a look at that here. So I'm going to rewrite this here. So again, if it's asking for the inverse, first step, 
change f of x to y. So y equals 1 over x minus 1. Then I'm going to switch the places of x and y. So it's then going to become x equals 1 over y minus 1. Again, my goal here is to get uh, y by itself. So if that's the case, for me to get y by itself, one second. So for me to get y by itself, I'm going to get rid of that fraction first. I'm going to multiply both sides times y minus 1. Again, that's going to get rid of my fraction for me. So now I'm left with y minus 1 times x, and that's going to equal 1. Okay. Now my goal here is to get that x away from that y because I don't want to distribute that at all. So divide both sides by x. So y minus 1 equals 1 over x. And the last step here is get y by itself. So add 1 to both sides. So y should equal uh, 1 over x plus 1. And that is our inverse. Okay. From there, continuing with what we have here. So against the same equation, f of x equals x minus 1. What is each of the following? So now we're getting to composition here, right? Anytime I see that circle there, my first step is to make sure I'm rewriting what I know here. So it's asking for the inverse. So we just solved for the inverse. I'm going to go ahead and write my inverse over here. So we know that the inverse of x equals, we just solved for it, 1 over x plus 1. From there, I'm going to rewrite this now. So again, with that inverse being closer to 1, it's going to be written as f of f of 1, f of negative 1, sorry, the inverse of 1 right so again my first step is to solve for the inverse of one so again all i'm doing there is plugging that into my equation right there i don't know what happened with that plus sign right there that was weird all right but uh it's gonna look like this so the inverse is gonna be equals one over one plus one so that's gonna equal one plus one which is two So now knowing that the inverse of 1 is 2, now we're going to solve for f of 2. So go back to my original equation, which is 1 over. Instead of x, I'm going to write 2 minus 1. So 1 over 1 equals 1. Okay. And we have one more example here. I'm going to go ahead and make sure I write my inverse here. So just so that we're on the same page. So f of negative 1 of x equals 1 over x plus 1. Okay. Same function we had before. I haven't changed anything. So this time I'm going to rewrite this first. So that should be the inverse of f of f of x. So again, that means the first thing we'll solve, and instead of it's not x actually, it should be of one, so f of one. So that first thing we're solving for is f of one. So I'm gonna go back to that f equation and plug in one. So uh, f of one equals one over one minus one. So that means we have one over zero. Now, anytime if I see we have one over zero, that means that this equation, if I see a zero on the bottom part of that fraction, it's gonna be undefined. So I cannot move forward with it because this is an undefined equation. So undefined. Undefined. All right. So that's just kind of how those problems are going to be solved. If I ever have a zero on my denominator, then that means that's going to end up being undefined. You don't have to go any further after that. Okay. All right. So with that being said now, that's our last problem. Your homework is going to be due on Wednesday, at, uh, April 1st at 11.59 p.m., Again, virtual hours are the same thing from 1 to 2. If you need help, please attend. I'll be here for you. And again, if you have questions or concerns, email me, reach out to me, remind me, whatever you have to do, I'm here for you guys. All right. Uh, other than that, guys, uh, I'm going to go ahead and end the video. It's been nice talking to you, and I will uh, see you all later.